Amen. Um, Our passage this morning is from Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 14. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. But when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they would not believe it. After these things, he appeared in another form to two of them, as they were walking into the country. And they went back and told the rest, but they did not believe them. Afterward, he appeared to the eleven themselves, as they were reclining at table, and he rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they had not believed those who had saw him after he had risen. This is God's word for us today. You may be seated. Thank you, Lee. Good morning. Welcome to the gathering of Grace Community Church. He is risen. risen Yes. How many of you were surprised and shocked that we actually got the angel that was sitting in the tomb to play bass for us just a moment ago? (laughs) Dressed in luminous, glowing white. That's a hard trick to pull that on, uh, on such short notice. No, I asked his permission to throw him under the bus and he said it was, he said it was fine. Um, No, he is risen, and then you appropriately respond, he is risen indeed. If that is true, and it is, why is it that on the first Sunday morning, every proclamation that he is risen was not met with the return, he is risen indeed, but it was met with the return, no, he's not. He's not. I don't believe it. It, it's, It's intentional that Mark actually shows us that the first declarations of he is risen were not met with the affirmative, but rather they were met with opposition. Not from the religious leaders and not from Caiaphas and not from Pilate and not from the Roman soldiers who actually carried out the crucifixion, but the very individuals who were told repeatedly that Jesus would die, that Jesus would be raised again, his closest disciples were the ones that when they heard the news, he is risen, they didn't respond with he is risen indeed. They responded with un belief. They responded with unbelief. We're going to look at why the disciples responded with unbelief and then how they found their faith or rather how Jesus found them and they came to faith. So three things that we're going to see this morning as we look at the account of the resurrection from Mark chapter 16 is we're going to focus on reluctant faith, but we don't want to end there. That would be depressing, right? Uh, we want to go through the process because this is looking at faith as it is, as it should be, but as it is. And sometimes our faith isn't there. Uh, Sometimes our faith, it falters. And we're going to see how God brings us from that place of declaration, he is risen, to that place of faith where we can say he is risen indeed, truly believe it and have that transform our hearts. So three things, the reality of reluctant faith, the reason why their faith is reluctant, and by application, ours can be at times as well. And then third, the remedy for reluctant faith. So please turn in your Bibles to, to Mark chapter 16, and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come to you in humble dependence. We ask you to speak to us through your word. We thank you that the tomb is empty. But as we look at the text, uh, even the tomb being empty did not guarantee that the disciples had faith. And it won't guarantee that there are Uh, that people here this morning have faith. Uh, Lord, that is a work that the Holy Spirit has to accomplish in in our hearts. And so, Father, I pray that you would accomplish that work 
in and through the preaching of your word and give me your words that Christ might be exalted and your people might be edified. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so first of all, the reality of the reluctant faith. The reality, you, you have to first of all start with what they've been told, what they've been told long before, well, not long before, but literally years before the resurrection. And as they approached Jerusalem and, and Jesus went to the cross, they were told repeatedly that this had to happen. So the first text that's mentioned there is Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, verse 31. The context is that Jesus and his, his disciples are in a place called Philippi, and he asks all of them, he says, well, who do the people say that I am? And, and they responded, well, it varies. Some people think that you're Elijah, come back, uh, from the dead. Some people think you're John the Baptist come back from the dead. Some, some people think that you're the, 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 one, of the, one of the prophets. And, and then Jesus said, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter speaks up for all of them. And Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, to which Jesus responds. He says, that wasn't revealed to you by man, but that was revealed to you, my father who is in heaven. And then Jesus says, I have to go to Jerusalem and I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be executed and I'm going to be buried, but I, on the third day, I will rise again. Now, Peter famously rebukes him at this point. He goes from hero to goat, not goat as greatest of all time, but goat, goat as in leave, you're annoying me. And he says, may it never be so. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, for you do not have the will of the Father, but your own will. So, but then he repeats it. So then later on, a chapter later, a chapter later, Jesus tells them again. He repeats it almost verbatim, almost verbatim. I have to go to Jerusalem. I will be arrested. I will be killed but I will rise again on the third day. Fast forward to chapter 10. I, what comes next? Have to go to Jerusalem. What comes next? I'm going to be killed. What comes next? I'm going to rise again on the third day. So now we find, our, find Jesus in Jerusalem. He has gone there. He has entered Jerusalem triumphantly on the foal of a donkey and he's entered the table or entered the, entered the temple and he's challenged the authorities. And he tells the disciples in chapter 14, after I have been executed and after I have risen again, I will go before you to Galilee and you will join me. Four separate times, Jesus has told them explicitly in no uncertain terms what was going to happen. And so on Sunday morning, when they first hear he is risen, what should the response have been? He is risen indeed. That's not what happened. What happened, Mark chapter 15, Jesus died just as he told them he was going to. And then in Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 7, Jesus rose just as he told them he would. That's what went down, and then how did they respond? Let's take a look. So the women, they go first. Mary, uh, Salome, and, and, a, and a group of women, they went to the tomb to anoint the body. Now, what are they expecting to find? It's not a trick question. A body. Not a living body, but a dead body. That's what they are going there to do. They are going to anoint the body, the corpse, for burial. So that's why they're there. When they go there, they're worried about how they're going to get the stone rolled away because the stone is massive. It's probably about two tons. It's not something that they can do, and they're not sure how they're going to accomplish this feat so they can get into the tomb. But while they, by the time they get there, the stone they find has already been rolled away, and they, they see the angel in the tomb, dressed in white, and he says, why do you look for the living among the dead? Among the dead. And then in verse 6, he says to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He 
has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. Okay, so that's the first declaration. That's the first. He is risen. And it comes from the angel in verse, seven, in verse 7. Then he gives them some instructions. He says, go and tell the disciples and Peter that he's going before you to Galilee. Now catch this. The second part of, of chapter, uh, chapter 7 here, or chapter 7, verse 7, he says, um, there you will see him just as he told you. So this is not news to them. It's news, but it's news based upon what Jesus said was going to happen. Said was going to happen. So how should they have responded? They should have responded, he is risen indeed, and then gone and told the disciples to go to Galilee because he's risen. So how do they respond? How, how do the first recipients of the news he has risen respond? Let's take a look in verse 8. And they went out and they fled from the tomb. When you flee something, why do you flee? For fear. This isn't excitement. He's risen. This is, we got to get out of here. The crazy bass player's in the tomb, right? <laughs> now, they're afraid. They're afraid. This hasn't seized them. It hasn't gripped them what's actually happened. <laughs> they've been told. They've, they've been told beforehand. Now they've been told afterwards, and they still don't believe it. They were afraid, trembling, and astonishment had seized them. They said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. They don't believe. They don't believe. So, now when he arose, this is Jesus, early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene. Now, she's one of the women who was there at the tomb with the other women that all fled. So later, she meanders back to the tomb. She meanders back to the tomb. She's grief-stricken. She is brokenhearted. John records this in his gospel, this personal encounter. And, and she goes there, and she's weeping, and Jesus appears to her, and she mistakes him for the gardener. And she asks Jesus a question. Please tell me where they have put him. What did the angel just tell her moments ago that he was risen? She does not believe it. And Jesus responds to Mary by speaking her name. And the moment she hears his voice, her eyes are opened and she realizes that it is him. It is him. So, verse 10. So she went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. Now, this is key. This is important. What are they doing? What's the text say? They're in mourning. They're grief-stricken. They're crushed. Okay, so Mary is no longer grief-stricken. She's no longer crushed. She's uplifted. Now she believes. She's encountered the resurrected Christ. But when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they would not believe it. They would not believe it. They would not believe it. And then finally, after these things, he appeared in another form to two of them as they were walking into the country. Now, you can get uh, uh, an expanded version of verse 12 in, in Luke chapter 24. Jesus appears to two disciples who are walking to, from Jerusalem to Emmaus. This is about seven miles from Jerusalem. This is a long walk, and they are walking, and Jesus... Uh, walks up beside them in another form. He doesn't, want him, he doesn't want them to see who he is just yet. And so he's like, what are you guys talking about? And they stop. Luke records that they stop. They literally just stop walking. And they look at him and they say, are you, are you the only person who doesn't know what's been going on in Jerusalem? And he's like, I, well, what, what's been going on? And they said, they said, that the one that we had hoped would deliver Israel was executed by our leaders. Now, what tense did they use, place the word hope in? Past tense. Their hope is gone. Their hope is dashed. We had hoped that Jesus was going to be the one to deliver Israel, but obviously it didn't work out. And 
this is so good. This is so good. And these two guys even go a step further and they said, and even our women came and told us this ridiculous tale that he had risen. So they're already confessing that they don't believe. And then Jesus, as he walked, took them through Genesis all the way through the Old Testament, showing them from the scriptures how the Christ had to suffer. And then as he broke bread with them, he opened their eyes and they saw, and then poof, he disappeared. And then they exclaimed to one another, were our hearts not burning within us as he was explaining from the scriptures how he had to suffer? And then they hightail it back to Jerusalem and they pick it up here in verse 12 and they, they went back, or verse 13, and they told the rest, but they did not believe them. So we've had three separate accounts of a proclamation that he is risen by eyewitnesses. First, the angel, second, Mary, and third, the two from Emmaus. All three of these eyewitness proclamations that he is risen were written, were met with skepticism and flat out unbelief, flat out unbelief. Now, it's not because they weren't told ahead of time what was going to happen. We've established this. Mark has established this. They were told in explicit, with, with, with absolute certainty, what Jesus was going to do. I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be executed. I will be buried, but, but I will raise again on the third day. This, this has been, they've been told this. And then when it actually goes, goes down exactly as he said it would, none of them believe until they actually see the resurrected Christ. You would think, you would think that they would have kind of a watch party, if you will, on Sunday morning. Like they should be anticipating this, right? So after they put him in the tomb, it'd be like, well, yeah, I know, but on the third day, he's going to rise. So that you, you'd think that's not doesn't happen at all. It doesn't happen. You see that there is unbelief. You see that there is reluctant faith. Why? Why? Why are they so reluctant? It seems obvious on the back end, right? You're reading this. You're like, how do they not see this coming? How do they not see this coming? They're not different than you and I. I don't believe that, that I would have acted any different differently than any of them did, and I don't believe that you would have acted any differently than any of the, they did. And, and we'll, we'll see why here in a second. So let's take a look at what Jesus says to all of them when he appears to them at the same time. Afterwards, he, being Jesus, appeared to the 11 themselves as they were reclining at table, and he, what? What did he do? He rebuked them. He took them to task for their unbelief and unbelief, and hardness of heart because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. So the reason for unbelief, Jesus links unbelief with hardness of heart. Now, when you think of hardness of heart in the Bible, who comes to mind? The first person that comes to my mind is Pharaoh. Pharaoh had a hard heart, okay? Also, you might think of, well, the religious leaders, the Pharisees had a hard heart. Typically, when we think of hard hearts in the Bible, we don't think Peter, James, John, Thomas, Matthew. We don't think of Mary. We don't think of the women. We don't think of his disciples as being ones who have hard hearts. But Jesus said that their unbelief and was due to hardness of heart. They it doesn't mean they have a total hardening of heart because they believe now. It means, but does mean that they have a hard heart. So we're going to take a look at what that means. What is, what is that? This is, this is earlier in Mark's gospel. This is right after the feeding of the 5,000. Right after the feeding of the 5,000. So Jesus had literally fed 5,000 people from a few loaves of bread and a handful of fish. And now they're on a journey and they're arguing with one another, and they're, they're worried about the fact that somebody forgot to bring the, hot, the, the, the packed lunch. Nobody brought any food. And so Jesus, aware of this, said to them, 
why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? He says, do you not perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? Okay, so this is what a hardened heart will do to someone. It, a hardened heart, if you have a hard heart, in any degree, it will blind you to the truth. It's right in front of you, but you can't see it. You, it just, you just can't see what's right in front of you. Something else it will do is that it will, it will you have ears, you, you have auditory sensations. You can tell people what you heard, but you don't actually hear it. You don't hear it. And furthermore, you don't remember. Has anybody, how many of you have, you've, you watched the disciples' reaction and think, how did they not remember? Well, they didn't have eyes to see when Jesus was telling them. They didn't have ears to hear when he was telling them. And they didn't understand it when they heard it. Why? Because their hearts were hard. In a degree, to a degree. They weren't as hard as, say, Pharaoh's heart was hard. They weren't as hard as, say, Judas's heart was hard. They weren't as hard as, say, Caiaphas or Ananias or Pilate's heart were hardened. But all of them, all of us, all of humanity suffers from a disease called a hardening of heart due to sin. That is a universal condition. And it's the reason why they were so reluctant in their faith. Faith, when we, when we use that word faith, some people mean different things by it. So let's, let's establish what this word means. In the, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 1, the author of Hebrews says, Now faith, it's the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So it's synonymous with belief, but belief about what? That's the question. The Bible's definition of faith, it's the assurance of things hoped for. That's the key right there. Things which have not yet been received, but are coming to pass, and it's what you set your sights on. It's what you are banking on. It's what you hope will come to pass. The assurance of what you believe is going to happen. And, and it hasn't happened. That's why it's faith. It hasn't happened yet. But, but you trust in it because of the trustworthiness of the person who gave you the information. So in this case, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Now, a hardness of heart occurs when we believe Jesus is at odds with what we hope in. Now, let that sink in. Hardness of heart occurs when we believe that Jesus as it is at odds with what we hope in. A couple examples. A couple examples. First of all, the religious leaders. Jesus was always a perceived threat to their hope. That's why they couldn't get on board with Jesus from day one. What they hoped the Messiah would do was overthrow Rome and allow them to maintain and establish their base of power. And Jesus is not interested in overthrowing Rome. He's interested in atoning for sin and giving men new hearts so that they could love one another and their enemies. That's not what they hoped in. Once they discovered that this said Messiah, Son of God, was not interested in establishing what they perceived to be their hope, they were no longer interested in him, period, end of story. That's how they are able to justify murder, to, main, to keep their hopes alive. Now, most of you are, are not hardened to that degree. I don't know you, that's why I say most. Some of you might be. Some of you might be. Most of us are probably more like the disciples where Jesus occasionally is perceived to a threat to their hopes. Let me just, let me draw this out just a little bit. How many of you have read the Bible, the New Testament, or you've heard the New Testament preached, specifically the words of Jesus, and you think to yourself, you've thought to yourself, if I live my life exactly how Jesus is telling me I should live my life in this passage, my life would suck. How many of you have actually thought that? Okay, that's, 
you perceive Jesus' words in that moment as a threat to what you place your hope in. Now think about all the things that Jesus says which could cause us to think that. If you want to gain your life, you have to lose it. If you want to be first, you have to be last. A kernel of wheat can't bear fruit unless it falls to the ground and dies. To be rich, you got to give everything away. You're starting to see, if you have to love your enemy. You're starting to see, now wait a minute, Jesus, you can't totally be serious on that. No one believes that. Exactly. Jesus presents this up to, upside down version of the kingdom that's not, it's counterintuitive. And it looks like if we follow through with that, our lives will be miserable. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who are persecuted for my name's sake. All of those things are painful. And and that that, uh, is, is, is a perceived threat to the things that we hope in. What do we hope in that we think is going to give our lives joy? If you could have ultimate joy, what would your life look like? Well, you'd be happy. You'd be healthy. You'd be wealthy. You'd be well-liked, you'd be prosperous. Did anybody put on the list, I'd be persecuted, uh, I'd be pursued, I'd, I'd, I'd be in physical pain, spiritual pain, uh, emotional pain. Nobody throws pain on the top 10 things of how to find joy. We just, that's just not how the way we work. We don't think that way. We don't think that way. One of the times when Jesus told them, take a look. He was teaching his disciples, saying, the Son of Man is going to be delivered in the hands of men. They will kill him. And and when he is killed, after three days, he even gives them the number of days. After three days, he will rise. Verse 32. But Mark throws this in. But they did not understand the saying, and they were afraid to ask. It doesn't make any sense. How many of you have read Jesus' words and you just kind of go along and you come to something, you don't understand it, but you just keep reading? Anybody? All of us have done that. All of us have done that. They're not different. They're not reading, they're listening. It's kind of like being at a party and you're at the party and this, somebody tells a joke and everyone's like, oh, that's hilarious. And you're like, I don't get it. But what do you do? I don't know what he's talking about, but I don't want to look dumb, right? That's what, they're, that's what they're doing. They have no idea. They have no idea what he's talking about, but nobody says anything, and they're afraid to ask. Why? That statement doesn't correspond with where their hope is. They're not hoping for a dead and resurrected Savior because that doesn't compute to them how that could possibly lead to joy. It doesn't make sense. They're going along with Jesus because they believe that he has the words of eternal life. They just don't understand what the words mean. You and I are not different. You and I, we can read the Bible. We can come to church. We can, we can trust Jesus for our sin, salvation of our sins. But when the fur flies and the hammer drops and there's pain involved, one of the first things we do is our faith falters. I don't know what your source of pain is, but I know that everybody suffers. And I know the generic response to pain and suffering is, why? This doesn't correspond with the Jesus that I thought was going to deliver me from all of my owies and all of life hurts. He never promised to, 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 to take us out of this world where there is suffering, but somehow we've got it in our heads that, that that's where our hope is. And when suffering occurs we find ourselves with just as much reluctant faith as the disciples. A couple weeks ago, I was getting uh, our vehicle fixed, and I was sitting there in the, in the, the lobby, and, and I ran into Jody Gaiman. You guys remember Rodney Gaiman? 
he used to be our worship leader uh, about six years ago. And five years ago, he and his family and about 50 people from Grace uh, planted the church in Riverside, Iowa called River City Church. Anyway, Jody and I were talking and Jody said, you know, I remember the first, the first time I came to Grace. It was like within the first couple weeks. It was 2013 and, and you were preaching on suffering and, and you had said, you were telling the story about how your wife how she contracted Lyme disease in 1998, but she was undiagnosed for six years. And then finally, when she met with the doctor, the doctor said, you're going to get your life back. And your wife told you that she was afraid. And, and, and you said that Stacy said, and I quote, I'm afraid to get better because I don't want to lose the intimacy that I found with Christ in suffering. And here's what Jody said to me. She goes, I heard that and I thought, that doesn't make any sense at all. I don't get it. She didn't get the joke. It's not a joke. But she didn't get it. She didn't understand. She said, I get it now. After having planted a church and after having suffered in ways that I didn't think I was capable of suffering, I understand it now, but I didn't get it then. I'm not any different. My wife's not any different. Jody's not any different. Neither's Peter. Neither's Mary. Neither's John. Neither you. When suffering comes in all its various forms, we're always shocked by it. We're always taken aback by it. It doesn't matter that we've got promises that God's going to do something with the suffering. We don't get it. And our initial response is to think that suffering is absolutely incompatible with joy. They can't coexist. They can't coexist. They can, but how? So what's the remedy? What did these disciples, who initially rejected the accounts of the resurrection, come to be the very people that built their life on the resurrected Christ and could not be dissuaded and were willing to go through hell, high water, persecution to make Christ known across the ends of the earth? How do they become those people? What changed? Three things have to happen. Remedy for reluctant faith. First of all, they have to know the truth. Something to believe in. Now, they had the truth. Jesus already told them. And then they had the truth through the testimony of those who had seen the resurrected Christ. So it starts with truth. Paul says in Romans chapter 10, verse 13, he says, faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the word of God. There must be a declaration. I have to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be buried. On the third day, I will rise again. Now, that's future tense. But for us, it's Jesus went to Jerusalem. Jesus was crucified for our sins. Jesus was buried in a borrowed tomb. But Jesus rose again on the third day. And he appeared to Peter, to Mary, to the rest of the disciples, and to Paul later on on the road to Damascus. That's a declaration of truth. But a declaration of truth, as true as it is, doesn't necessarily produce faith. They had the declaration of truth, but it didn't equal faith. And that's why you can come to a Bible-teaching church that believes in truth and sit and hear the Word of God and not, and not, respond in saving faith. So on Easter Sunday, do not confuse your attendance at a worship service honoring the resurrected Christ with saving faith in said Christ. They are not equivalent. You've heard the truth, it doesn't necessarily mean, you necessarily mean that you, you have saving faith. So what else needs to happen? You, you have to be, we have to be tested to determine whether or not we actually believe what it is that has been proclaimed. Testing. Here, here's the thing. Suffering shows us the quality of, faith, of our faith, whether it's, it's weak or whether it's strong. See, when pain comes in all its various forms, when pain comes and we see that that faith in Christ is at odds with what we hoped Christ would do for us, it forces us to, to reckon whether or not we really believe in the Christ of the Bible over Christ of our own making. 
You know, we read the Bible or we've heard sermons preached and, and we pick up on verse and you say, ooh, I like that one. But then those other verses where Jesus says the first, to be first, you have to be last. To, to live, you have to be willing to die. We, we read those and we go, I don't get it. We keep on going. And then we're thrust in an environment where we have to embrace that. And we're like, okay, did I really believe in the Jesus of the Bible? Or was I just cherry picking verses that, that, that would advance the hope that I would be healthy, wealthy, wise, pretty, happy, fit, rich, well-liked. And, and what suffering does is it sometimes it unmasks the fact that we're not really building our house on the rock. We're, we're building a house of cards on a card table that we bought at a garage sale. Those are not equivalent. And, and suffering will reveal what it is we actually say we believe. It's painful, but it's absolutely crucial. But testing in and of itself is not enough either. Why? Because sometimes testing, individuals will walk away and they will totally abandon their faith. I can point to dozens of people over the last 25 years who at one time were bold professors of Christ who now reject that Jesus Christ has risen from the grave. What happened? In every single case, those individuals entered a time of testing and they walked away from Jesus. So testing in and of itself doesn't, doesn't lead to fruitfulness. It doesn't lead to a solid faith. Something else has to happen. That's the third thing. There has to be a turning. A turning from, a turning from the idea of Jesus, this, this pseudo-savior who you thought existed to make you healthy, happy, and wise, and well-liked in this life, a life without suffering. You thought that Jesus existed to take away pain to the Jesus that actually exists that doesn't promise any of that but instead promises to take you through pain to resurrection. Do you understand that for a resurrection there must be a prerequisite and what is that prerequisite? Death. There is no resurrection without a death. We don't want to hear that. We just want a fluffy Easter bunny version of Jesus which doesn't exist. Some of the parents are like, now what do I do? <laughs> Tell your kids the truth about who Jesus is <coughs> and what he came to do. So... Jody Gaiman, she said that she didn't understand when she first heard it in 2013, but she gets it now. She had to go through suffering to get it. She had to be tested. And we're not different. The story that I told in 2013, I didn't share all of it. It takes too long to tell, but let me just give you a little bit of detail to, to, to give you an understanding of what Stacy was, was undergoing. Because when she told me that, I didn't understand it either. I just looked at her in awe, like, oh, you're one of those people that actually believe the Bible's true. And I preach the Bible, by the way. It's not like I don't believe it's true, but experientially, I, we're on different, different places, at least at the time. And Stacy would tell me that it, an example of, of where she met Jesus in the midst of her pain, and, and this is the turning, this is where you turn from the Jesus you thought you knew to the Jesus that, that is. And she met that Jesus. It's not that she wasn't a Christian. It's not that I wasn't a Christian. I was six years into teaching the Bible vocationally. We were both followers of Christ, but we were untested. We were untested. She said that after about five years of being just sick and, and getting worse, she could barely get out of bed. It was a victory if she could get herself out of bed, showered and, and ready for the kids to come home from school. That's a victory. And so one particular morning, she woke up and she, she had it on her agenda. She, she wanted to do something productive, but the house was a mess 
And, and she, she couldn't do any of the things that she used to do. She used to be real involved in church, and then she wasn't anymore. She used to be real active, involved in her children's school, and then she wasn't anymore. And she just felt like she couldn't be a mom, she couldn't be a wife, she couldn't be a friend, she couldn't be anything. She couldn't do anything. She just wanted to just do something productive. So she managed to get herself out of bed, and she, she stumbled into the next room, which was my office, and she thought, well... Maybe I can just pick up something because my office is a disaster because it's me. And she, she doesn't last 30 seconds before she can't stand because her legs are in so much pain and they're so weak. And so she just drops to her knees and then she's exhausted. And so she sprawls out on the floor, belly down. And when, when you're belly down in a room... That, that I occupy, which is filthy, you see filth at a different level. <laughs> and so she can see all the, the garbage that's fallen off of my desk that's under the desk. And she thought, while I'm down here, while I'm here, maybe I'll just pick something up and move it to the trash. And so she picks up what she thought was a business card. But it was a memory verse. It's Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 11. The Lord said, Surely I will deliver you for a good purpose. And she just looked at that verse and she just wept. How could this be for a good purpose? I can't do anything. The Jesus that she hoped would remove all of her sufferings and the Jesus that is didn't match at that moment. But she cried out to Jesus and she wanted to meet him in that moment of pain and she, she didn't hear anything audible. It wasn't an audible voice, but she unmistakably heard the words and the voice of Jesus. I'm going to use this for a good purpose. I'm going to use this for your glory or for my glory and for your good. And Stacy said that at that moment, she felt special. She felt selected and chosen by God and entrusted with something, this severe form of suffering. And all of a sudden, she felt the presence of God in a way that she had never felt before. And so when she was told that she's going to get her life back, she was afraid to lose that. See, that's, that's a real Jesus. Be leery of any preacher or pastor or prophet who tells you that God's going to give you everything you want and take away all of the pain. That's a lie. It, unless he's talking about after Jesus returns or when you go to be with him. The Jesus who is does not promise to remove pain. The Jesus that is promises to walk with us through the valley of the shadow of death. He promises to harness the very thing which is causing us pain to bring it about for his future glory and our good. And that is why Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, he says, I don't consider these light and momentary afflictions. They're, they're, they are preparing for us a weight of glory. These light and momentary afflictions are preparing for us an eternal weight of glory. Heaven, heaven is not a consolation prize for the suffering that you experience. Heaven is a direct result of of Christ's suffering, and God somehow engineers your suffering to bring about his glory and your good. He said, how does that work? I don't know. He said, well, how do you know it's true? Because the tomb's empty. There is no greater example of human suffering than the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, where he bore the wrath of mankind. There is no greater injustice. There is no greater physical pain. There is no greater emotional pain. There is no greater spiritual pain. There is no greater suffering than the cross, but the resurrection nullifies. 
not just nullifies, it harnesses all of the bad and makes it into something which is more beautiful than anything or anyone could ever imagine. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen indeed. As the praise team comes forward, we're going to sing one more song. I would like to encourage you to meditate on the truth of the resurrection and to, to recognize that the testing that you're experiencing, the suffering that you're experiencing, God desires to use for your good and for his glory. So in that testing, turn not from Christ away from him, but turn to him. Ask him to meet you in your moments of suffering, in your moments of pain, and he will. He will. Let him turn your reluctant faith into fruitful faith. Please remain standing for the reading of a benediction from 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfaded, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Father, we thank you that Jesus has conquered sin, that he has conquered death. We thank you, Lord, that every trial, every tribulation, Lord, in Christ will be met, Lord, with, um, with victory. We thank you that these trials that we faith are nothing more than tests and that they are, in fact, momentary afflictions. Thank you, Lord, that the resurrection is proof is proof that you will harness all of this for good and for your glory. We pray that you would give us faith to endure and to be a faithful witness. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. Go in grace. Happy Easter.